Sir Isaac Newton is generally considered to be the greatest scientist who ever lived. In his later years, he was asked how he, as one man, had managed to make such significant contributions to the world of science. He replied by stating that he achieved this by thinking of nothing else. In its simplest terms, success begins with exercising your power of choice and using it to take systematic, purposeful control over the thoughts you hold in your conscious mind. Most people spend their lives in a form of sleep, going about the daily activities almost totally preoccupied by a continuous stream of disorganized thoughts. You've experienced this phenomenon when you've gotten into your car and driven to work or across town, lost in thought with almost no memory of the trip at all. Many of your habitual routines and conversations take place with a low level of awareness, almost as if you were in a mental fog, with little or no recollection of the particular flow of events. Sometimes this preoccupation is deliberate. You use it to avoid thinking about parts of your life that you'd rather not confront or deal with. Sometimes it is simply automatic. You've been going through the motions for so long that your thought processes are unthinking. You only wake up temporarily when you are shocked or surprised, as when you're cut off in traffic or caught off guard. But as soon as you recover your composure, you slip back into the warm, gentle stream of waking sleep, where your thoughts just flow past amid a continual collage of feelings and images. To become all you can be, you must live more consciously. You must become more alert, more aware, and more awake. You must take more control over your thought processes so that you move in the direction of your own choosing, rather than steering blindly on mental autopilot, as most people do. You begin the process of awakening by reflecting on your life, past, present, and future, as an exercise in awareness. Imagine that you are here on this earth to do something wonderful with your life, to become an exceptional person, and to make an important contribution to your world. Imagine that this is all part of a great master plan that has been carefully designed with your best interest in mind, and that every event and circumstance of your life is an indispensable part of a big jigsaw puzzle, the outline of which you can only begin to see when you stand back and start to look at your life from a higher plane or a greater distance. Assume that whatever your current situation or difficulty, it is exactly what you require right now to teach you something that you need to know before you can continue on your upward journey. With this perspective, you can see that every experience is a positive experience if you choose to view it as an opportunity for growth and self-mastery. Now, project back with and with calmness, clarity, and a positive mental attitude, think about how every previous experience and situation of your life might have been sent to you at exactly the right time to teach you something you needed to learn so that you could continue moving toward the wonderful life that awaits you. Imagine that the events of your life could not have been otherwise than they were, especially if you were operating on autopilot most of the time. As you stand back and appreciate the incredibly complex interconnectedness of events that have brought you to where you are in life right now, you will begin to develop the perspective of the philosopher. You will begin to superimpose on your experience what is called a sense of coherence, an attitude and a feeling that your life is part of something greater than yourself, and that everything fits together and happens for a reason. As you think of your life as a series of events and experiences that are conspiring toward your achieving some great goal or making some great contribution to mankind, you begin to develop a sense of destiny, destiny, the hallmark of potential greatness. As a human being, you must take control of the internal and external aspects of your life and get them all playing in harmony around a central theme of your own choosing. You do this by keying into the immutable mental laws of the universe. All real and lasting success comes from organizing your life in harmony with these general principles. The first law is the law of expectations. It's truly amazing when we confidently expect something worthwhile to materialize in our lives. It invariably does. It works like pure, unadulterated magic. It gives each of us a kind of magic wand with which we can bring all sorts of interesting and rewarding events and things into our lives. Those who have cultivated this power, who consciously and actively work at it regularly, do the most amazing things. In giveaway television programs, we watch people, young people, playing it safe, saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. I read a financial column in the Miami Herald the other day in which a young man of just 20 wrote of his losses in the mutual fund and commented that he'd been unable to sleep and had lost weight over it. The columnist commented that he should never risk his money, he should put it in the bank or the savings and loan where he knows it's safe. I think it's safe to say that the majority of people have a suspicious and negative outlook toward those life situations which, to an intelligent minority, represent virtually unlimited opportunities. Now, this is not to say that positive and expectant people do not occasionally lose money in their investments or have problems. I'm sure they do. 
It's just that it doesn't bother them the way it seems to bother most people, and over the long haul, well, they're miles ahead of the pack. They face their days with an attitude that expects the best, and that's what they're going to get as long as they can maintain it. What others worry and stew about, they confidently expect a successful outcome, and most of the time, they get it. If you have trouble maintaining this powerful force for good in your life, a reminder card placed where you'll see it every morning when you get up and at odd times during the day can help you get on course and form a very valuable new habit. You apply the law of expectations in your own life by confidently expecting to gain something worthwhile from everything that happens to you. Make your life into an adventure. Just imagine if you went around all day believing that something wonderful was about to happen to you. Think how much more positive, optimistic, and cheerful you'd be if you were absolutely convinced that everything was conspiring to make you happy and successful. Your expectations would quickly become self-fulfilling prophecies. The second law is the law of subconscious activity. This law says that any idea or thought that you accept as true in your conscious mind will be accepted without question by your subconscious mind. Your subconscious will immediately begin working to bring it into your reality, making all your words, feelings, actions, and even your body language fit a pattern consistent with your dominant thoughts and your goals. Take time each day to sit and soak your mind in positive and uplifting thoughts, knowing that whatever you dwell upon long enough and hard enough will eventually materialize in the world around you. Here's an action exercise for you. Take a sheet of paper and make a list of all the things that you want to see in your life. Write down everything, happiness, health, good friends, travel, prosperity, recognition. Let your imagination run freely. Now, here's the hard part. For the next 24 hours, think and talk only about the things on your list. See if you can get through one entire day without criticizing, condemning, complaining, or getting angry, upset, or worried about anything. See if you have the willpower and strength of character to think about only what you want for one whole day. This exercise will give you a real insight into where you are in your development, and it will also show you how far you have yet to go. As I read story after story of famous men and women, and as I reflected on their biographies and autobiographies, I was struck by the common thread that ran through all of them. They all seemed to have or to develop an unshakable belief in their ability to overcome all obstacles and reach some great height. This belief or conviction seemed to give them powers not possessed by the ordinary person. They went on to accomplish remarkable things, often against overwhelming odds and in defiance of the predictions of people around them. When I left high school and began drifting from job to job, I had no central purpose or aim, aside from somehow seeing the world. Like most people, I slipped into the reactive, responsive mode. I took whatever job came along, I associated with whoever happened to be around at the time. Instead of planning my life, I just reacted to my external environment and responded to my emotional and physical needs. I assumed that this was all there is. I came to accept unconsciously that what I knew and what I was doing constituted the upper limits of what was possible for me. The best I felt I could do was to react as intelligently and as constructively as possible and try not to make too many mistakes. When my studies in psychology, religion, and metaphysics mentioned the subconscious mind, I neither understood it very well nor did I attempt to use it to help me. However, the more I learned about the mental laws that govern our behavior and determine our results, the more I realized there was a hidden dimension of achievement that I was missing. The more I understood the importance of the self-concept and learned that everything we do on the outside is predetermined by our belief systems, the more I felt I was coming closer to the combination that would open the lock. Then, I understood the meaning of human potential. If you and I are using only 10% or less of our potentials for effectiveness and achievement, the other 90% or more must be contained in mental powers we have not yet tapped. I concluded that to get the most out of myself, I needed the access codes that would enable me to get into and harness these enormous capabilities. Your subconscious mind is enormously powerful. When you use it properly, it can help you to move more rapidly toward the achievement of your goals and desires than you ever dreamed possible. You can use your subconscious mind for creation or destruction, for good or for evil. You can be a prince or a pauper, depending on the way you operate. To fulfill your potential, you must learn how to access it at will and use it for your purposes intelligently and constructively. Let me give you an example that illustrates this. My lawyer was showing me through his offices not long ago. He took me into the typing pool where there were several secretaries typing letters and legal documents. Each of the secretaries was hooked into a mini-computer that was available and accessible to all of them. 
As we left the room, he explained to me that he and his partners had spent more than $100,000 on this computer installation, which they had purchased about two years ago. He told me that when it was installed, all the secretaries working there at the time were given training on how to use the computer to increase the quantity and quality of legal work they could produce. Over time, he said, all of the original secretaries had left or gone on to other things. They were replaced one by one with legal secretaries who had no computer training. Because we're so busy, he said, no one has had a chance to go back and train these new secretaries on how to get the most out of our computer system. So now, instead of using this computer for advanced information and word processing, our secretaries simply use it as a glorified typewriter, typing one letter or one document at a time and spending many hours to produce what the many computers could produce in a few minutes. Unfortunately, most people are like those secretaries. They work every day with their minds, but they use their powerful mental computers for only the most rudimentary tasks, and then they wonder why their work is so hard and why they seem to produce so little. When I was washing dishes, I was convinced that the only way I could make more money was by working longer hours and by washing even more dishes. I eventually learned that the belief that you can only improve your life with longer hours and harder work leads you down a blind alley. The answer, I found, was to work smarter, to use more of my mental powers rather than my physical powers to achieve my goals. Successful people are those who have learned how to operate their conscious and subconscious minds in harmony, enabling them to get the things they want far faster and with much less effort. This discovery changed the focus of my efforts and the direction of my entire life. Your subconscious mind is like a huge memory bank. It permanently stores everything that ever happens to you. Your subconscious mind has what is called a homeostatic impulse. It keeps your body temperature at 98.6 degrees, just as it keeps you breathing regularly and your heart beating at a certain rate. Your subconscious mind also practices homeostasis in your mental realm by keeping you thinking and acting in a manner consistent with what you've done and said in the past. All your habitual patterns of thinking and acting are stored in your subconscious mind. It is the seat of your habits. It has memorized all your comfort zones, and it works to keep you in them. Your subconscious mind causes you to feel emotionally and physically uncomfortable whenever you attempt to do anything new or different or to change any of your established patterns of behavior. Your subconscious mind functions like a gyroscope or a homing beam, keeping you in balance and on track based on the data and instructions that you've previously programmed into it. You can feel your subconscious pulling you back toward your comfort zone each time you try something new. Even thinking about doing something different from what you're accustomed to will make you feel tense and uneasy. To grow, to get out of your comfort zone, you have to be willing to feel awkward and uncomfortable doing it the first few times. If it's worth doing well, it's worth doing poorly until you get a feel for it, until you develop a new comfort zone at a new, higher level of competence. Here is a powerful technique you can use to program your subconscious mind. Imagine you go to a theater to see an exciting adventure movie. You arrive at the theater 10 minutes before the earlier scheduled movie is over. Instead of waiting in the lobby, however, you go into the theater, sit down, and watch the last 10 minutes of the movie. You see how the entire plot unfolds and how everything turns out for the principal actors. You see the problems resolved and what happens to everyone when the movie ends. Then, when the next showing begins, you go back and sit through the entire movie from the beginning. Only this time, instead of being caught up in the suspense and drama of the unfolding plot, you relax and watch the movie objectively. You take time to appreciate the cinematography, the dialogue, the way that the scenes are connected, and how the plot unfolds and develops. You are calm and relaxed. You are far less anxious or emotional than you would be if you had not already seen the last 10 minutes, because you already know how it ends. This is exactly the same method you use to program your new self-concept and your goals into the deeper levels of your subconscious mind, where they lock in and take on a power of their own. The emotional component is critical. It is the calm, confident, expectant, positive emotion combined with relaxation that activates your subconscious and brings about rapid change. Here's a five-step process you can use to implement this method to help bring about any desired mental, emotional, or physical condition. Step 1. Verbalize and affirm your desired outcome. For example, if you're wrestling with a problem involving someone else, you could say calmly and confidently, this situation is resolved happily with good for all concerned. Your statement should be a clear description of your desired outcome or end state. Don't get wrapped up in detail. Don't worry about the process. Step 2. Visualize and clearly see the outcome you desire in the situation. 
See yourself and everyone else involved happy and at peace with the outcome. This will require effort and concentration. Step 3. Emotionalize your combined affirmation and visualization by creating the feeling that you will actually experience when everything is resolved happily. Step 4. Release the situation completely. Just let it go, as you would if someone you trusted said that you would take care of it and that you need not ever think of it again. Step 5. Realization, the appearance in your outer world of the solution. The realization or manifestation of your desire happens in direct proportion to which you have completely released all concern for the outcome and turned your mind to other things. This attitude of calm, confident expectation that all will be well is an experience of higher consciousness. Religious people refer to this as prayer, and it is said that prayer is the highest form of affirmation. Ralph Waldo Emerson called this state of consciousness being in tune with the infinite. It doesn't matter what you call it. All that matters is that it works with amazing reliability. Just a few little pointers on the mind. Here's number one. It needs to be nourished, needs to be fed. There's an Old Testament phrase that says humans cannot live just on bread alone or food alone. Dogs can, a crocodile can, a spider can. Humans cannot exist just on food. Here's what it says. Humans also need words. Words nourish the mind. Words give life. Words create insight. Because there's more than one way to see. If we see with our eyes, we call that sight. But there's another way to see called insight. That's why we come gather for a couple of days, attend the classes, go to the training, read the books, do all the stuff is to develop more insight, letting our mind be nourished to think, ponder, and wonder. And conceive ideas, projects, purpose, give structure to something for the future, whether it's better health or better career, better future. Next, the mind needs to be exercised. We talked a bit about that earlier, exercise by debate, exercise by reading both sides of the debate, both sides of the question, major life issues, major political issues. Don't leave yourself out of the great debate. 1. The mind needs to be nursed by ideas. 2. It needs to be refined and stimulated and exercised by debate. We need both sides of the human drama represented. The reason why the Bible is such a classic book in studying all kinds of stories is because the Bible is full of stories on both sides, the evil side and the good side. The Bible, Old Testament, said this. King came to power, and he was a good king, and he ruled for 18 years. Then it says the next king came to power, and he was a bad king, and he put up idols. He became the bad king. So, it reads, good king, bad king showing both sides of the human spectrum and drama. Some stories that we read in the Bible, of people to admire, others of people to despise. In your library, you need a book on Gandhi, and you need a book on Hitler. One book to show you how noble someone's aspirations can be, and the other book to show you how despicable and how evil someone's goals can be. Both sides, we study good and evil, one we love, and one we hate. We study illness, we study health. Someone says, well, you can't study the negative things. You have to study the negative things. You have to give voice to and mind to and time to both sides of the issue so that you can strengthen your side of the argument. In raising our kids, we have to pose both sides, what's the dangerous side and the safe side. In one of the seminars that I'm sure some of you have attended, I talk about philosophy that makes the difference. Philosophy does two things, each person's personal philosophy. So. Jot this down. Our personal philosophy does two things. One helps us to see the dangers on one side so we can avoid or minimize those. Then our personal philosophy needs to be developed so we can see the opportunities on the other side so we can maximize those. And for the balance of your life, that's going to be the twin challenge in developing ideas and philosophy and strengthening all of it so that you can avoid the dangers, maximize the opportunities because the dangers never go away. The dangers to our ship of state called the country, the danger to the enterprise, the danger to the corporation, dangers always lurk both inside and out. Dangers lurk on the inside of our own mind. When I was a kid, they used to have those little cartoons have a little boy with a gremlin on one side and a little angel on the other side. And the little devil and little gremlin said, go ahead and do it, it's okay. Little angel said, no, no, no. So when kids are young, they've got this debate to engage in. Did I or shouldn't I? One voice says go ahead, the other one says no, no. So, we hope as the years pass, and as the classes pass, 
And as we go from grade 1 to grade 2 to grade 5 to grade 10, we will learn more. As Abraham said, to listen to the better angels of our nature, to appeal to our conscience and let our conscience help, along with God and whatever else you belong in that has good influence, on helping to make right decisions, avoiding the evil one, avoiding the danger, the dark side, and appeal to ourselves to engage in the positive side, the opportunity side. The battle of the mind is significant for us every day, what to think, what not to think. My mentor, Mr. Shah, said, stand guard at the door of your mind, and you decide what enters. You decide what to fill up your mind with because it becomes the material with which you build your future. So, engaging the mind to make rational decisions about life. Beware of the thief on the street that's after your purse, but also beware of the thief in your mind that's after your promise. The thief in your mind that says you're too short, you're too tall, you've never done it before, what makes you think you can do it now, it's not going to work for you. Someone else could find the book, you'll never find the book. If you found the book, you wouldn't read it. If you did read it, you wouldn't understand it. That's stuff that goes on in our mind. So, jot down this key phrase, it's one of the best for the day. Whatever you do, don't become a victim of yourself. As you engage in this debate, what to eat, what not to eat, where to go, where not to go, what to say, what not to say, what to do, what not to do. Make sure that you strengthen the positive side of this argument with yourself so that day by day, you become healthier, day by day, you become stronger, day by day, you become wiser, day by day, you build a better shield and immunity, and inside immunity to ward off disease, but an outside immunity to ward off all the negative and all the trash and all the stuff that would not enhance your personal development nor your promise for the future. So, be careful, if somebody says to me these eggs are rotten, I'm not going to make an omelette and try it. I'm going to take their word for it. So, feed the mind, exercise the mind, and build your library. I recommend three books that were recommended to me when I started my library when I was 25 years old. In those accelerated days of personal development for me, about seven years worth, so fantastically changed my bank account, changed my income, revolutionized my future with the foundation my parents gave me, meeting Mr. Shah at age 25, I'm telling you, it's been a journey for me like no other. Ever since then, I've had mentors along the way. I'm telling you, that keep my mind stimulated, they keep my keen. They help me to evaluate into way what is good, what is okay, what is better, and what is prosperous in terms of your life. Mentors, and that first mentor I had recommended these three books. First was the Bible. Now, I had an advantage there because my parents made sure I was a pretty good scholar by age 19. A good book to serve you all of your life, one of the major sources of ideas, stories, poetry, history, a major source for stimulation. Next, he recommended the book called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Think and grow, good words, think and grow, and rich. I went for it, got the book, paid less than 50 cents for it. Some of the ideas in it changed my life. Next, C.H. recommended the book The Richest Man in Babylon by George Cleon. Helped me become a millionaire by age 32. Totally changed my economic future, just the ideas in a simple little book. Amazing. Then he recommended something for me to listen to by Earl Nightingale called The Greatest Secret. That was my listening library to begin with, The Greatest Secret by Earl Nightingale. So, your listening library and your visual library. Next now is your reading library. And we won't go through a whole list of the best books. But here's a good book to get if you want a good list of the best books. It's called How to Read a Book, Simple How to Read a Book by Adler, chief editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica, Mortimer Adler. He wrote a book called Six Great Ideas. That's excellent. He wondered, are ideas tangible? Are ideas real or are they nothing but? He wrote this book along with another author, How to Read a Book. Now, if you master this book, you can get so much more from a book. Now it's a kind of a tough book to get through, but it'll give you some ideas on how to take a book and get the most out of it. Things, take a book and get the most out of it. But in this book is also a list of what he calls are the greatest books ever written. And I've used that book, that list as a centerpiece for my library. It's got the classics, which I missed. I only went to one year of college, so I missed a whole bunch of stuff. I started making up for that by collecting these best books ever written. Interestingly enough, on that list is Old and New Testament, 
on every scholar's list, east or west. You just can't miss those as major sources. In addition to that, there's a book called Lessons of History written by Durant. And I offer it because it's one of the classic writings of all time. You may not agree with his premise, but you'd certainly have to agree that it's one of the best well-written books ever. He and his wife wrote about 11 volumes on civilization. Take a speed reading course, you can get through those. But this little book, Lessons of History, is sort of a summary of their ideas on history. It's a classic. Then a classic, I think most everybody's got called as a man thinketh by James Allen, where each sentence is a seminar. And you may not agree with his premise either in certain instances, but you don't want to read just what you agree with and not just to read the positive. Make this note, you cannot live on mental candy just like you can't feed your children ice cream all the time and hope that they will be healthy. So, you cannot live on mental candy. Someone says, well, I just read the positive stuff. That's not enough. And the reason is because you need to know both sides of the issue. 